All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back uh, to, well, actually, I don't, I guess it's not welcome back, is it? It's welcome to your first Liberty Radio book review. Um, I'm going to have to come up with a better title than that, I think. Uh, but we're not going to spend a lot of time trying to figure out the uh, finer points of media production at the moment because that's not what this time is intended for. No, we are here to take a look into a book that was pub first published back in 2021, uh, authored by Henry Kissinger, Eric Schmidt, and Daniel Huttenloker. Uh, I'm guessing that that is how you pronounce his name. That's how it's spelled, and that's how it looks phonetically. And that's how I learned the English language uh, was through phonics. So that's how I'm going to pronounce it. If that's not correct, well, uh, you're just going to have to let me know what the correct pronunciation is down in the comments below. But what we are here to look at today, and that's not the button I wanted, that's the button I wanted, is the book The Age of AI and Our Human Future. Now, a couple of things to note about this book starting out. It is not very long. Uh, I think it checks in at, let me see, let me focus on the page here. Yeah, 272 pages front to back. Uh, some of that is introduction. Some of that is uh, citations. Uh, I don't remember specifically if the book has an index or not. Uh, it might, but I'm guessing it probably doesn't. I, I didn't specifically go looking for it, which is why I don't know if it does. But what I'm getting at is it's not a long book and it's not a hard read if you're just going through it, right? And reading through the book. Uh, I would think an accomplished reader could probably easily get through the book in a single day, uh, if not quicker. So it's really not uh, a very difficult book to get through. It is, however, a rather dry book considering the subject matter, which is why I decided to take one for the team and uh, read it for you and tell you what I got from it. Now, before we get started on the full subject matter itself, let's take a moment to look at the individual offers. First up, of course, we have Heinz Kissinger, career bureaucrat and globalist lapdog, uh, received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1973 for blowing up Vietnamese children. Uh, and of course, who can forget the overthrow of Chilean President Salvador Allende, uh, which then, of course, allowed the Pinochet regime, regime to seize control in Chile and uh, commit uh, millions of atrocities against the population down there. Uh, you know him, you can't stand him, uh, and unfortunately we're still being forced to live with him for however much longer is anyone's guess. Uh, that, of course, being Henry Kissinger. Moving on to the next author, we have Eric Schmidt, former CEO of Google, as well as board member of both Carnegie Mellon and Princeton Universities, former chairman of the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence from 2019 to 2021, current chairman of the board at the Broad Institute at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, hey, wasn't, uh, wasn't Epstein... Uh, involved uh, intimately with the Broad Institute and a lot of the work they were doing? Seems to me I remember something like that. Maybe you remember it too. If you do, put that memory in the comments down below so that other people can learn from what you know. All right. Uh, oh, and just, you know, general uh, scumbag uh, billionaire 
elitist, uh, Eric Schmidt. Our final author is Daniel Peter Hudenloker, as uh, Wikipedia tells us, filling us in on the middle name, the inaugural dean of the Schwartzman College of Computing at the aforementioned Massachusetts Im Institute of Technology. He was formerly a director at Amazon. Oh, isn't that interesting? You ever heard of, of that company, Amazon? Uh, he's also owner of 24 patents in computer vision, whatever the hell that is. Uh, he is an alum of the University of Chicago as well as the University of Michigan, and that's about everything that we're going to learn from his Wikipedia page because in good spook tradition, there really just isn't much there uh, other than specific connections to other globalist institutions. So uh, good job, Wikipedia, uh, on covering up what Mr. Uh, Hootenlocher is, uh, or I should say who he is actually working for. All right, so that gives us a little bit of an idea of the people that uh, we're going to be looking at the writings of. Uh, there is an introduction in the book. I don't remember specifically who penned it, and I did not write it down, so I'm guessing it probably wasn't that important. But it does help set the stage for the rest of the book. So let's dig into my notes, and I do have about 13 pages of notes uh, that I have here from my reading. I don't know if we're going to cover everything that's in the notes because I want to try and keep this at about an hour. So we'll see how good we do on that. But I intend for this to give anyone viewing this video a good idea of exactly what is in this book um, as far as information is concerned and what the purpose of this book appears to be uh, besides what the authors claim their intended purpose for the book is. So to set the stage, uh, in the year 2020, American AI startups raised almost $38 billion in funding. Asian startups raised $25 billion, and European startups raised $8 billion. So that is well in excess of $50 billion heading into the scan, scamdemic uh, that was being spent on AI development. Now, the authors claim that AI is an enabler of many industries and facets of life, including, but obviously not limited to, because why would you want to put limitations on a control structure, uh, including scientific research, manufacturing, transportation, law enforcement, advertising, education, logistics, defense, politics, and art and culture. Um, I mean, is there anything left in the world? Once you, you break it, I mean... They don't mention leisure activities in there anywhere, but of course that's because we're already uh, using their AI, and I'll try to remember uh, the pips as often as I can whenever I say AI, uh, and you'll see why uh, a little bit later on. So the authors say that the outcome will be the alteration of human identity and the human experience of reality at levels not experienced since the dawn of the modern age. In other words, what they're saying is that the fourth industrial revolution, as it is so lovingly called uh, by Klaus and his minions at the World Economic Forum, is going to look very similar transformationally to the first industrial re revolution, which of course gave us uh, wonderful things like uh, the steam engine, the cotton gin, and uh, factories, uh, as well as their accompanying, accompanying schools. 
I apologize for all the flubs uh, in the speech this morning, folks, but it is morning. I've only been up for a couple of hours. I wasn't actually intending to do this right now, and I haven't finished all my coffee yet. So the questions the authors believe we should be asking about AI are as follows. What do AI-enabled innovations in health, biology, space, and quantum physics look like? That's number one. Number two, what do AI-enabled best friends look like, especially to children? Number three, they, they got to focus on the children. Number three, what does AI-enabled war look like? See, they put that at number three to make you believe that that's not a higher priority, right? That that's not actually like the number one priority. That's the first question that they want to answer. Moving on. Number four, does AI perceive aspects of reality humans do not? Number five, when AI participates in addressing and shaping action, how will humans change? And the final question, what then will it mean to be human? And I urge everyone in the audience to keep those questions in mind because going through, this is the first time that I've looked at those questions since reading the book. They don't actually answer any of those questions in the course of the book. Spoiler, spoiler alert, uh, for uh, anyone who wants to go ahead and uh, check out now, I advise you not to. Uh, there's still a lot to learn, but uh, you know, it's your life. You can do whatever you want. So the authors touch on COVID-19 and the resulting lockdowns very early on, claiming that during those lockdowns, the world suffered losses and dislocations it has only suffered in the past century during wartime and I would argue that what we've suffered through for the last three years has actually been worse than wartime because it has affected everyone, not just those in the theater of battle. So the first chapter of the book is called Where We Are. The author's obviously trying to uh, set the stage and present uh, the current view of the world or worldview as you uh, might call it for the introduction of AI to civilization. First, they tell us uh, how great Google's DeepMind AI is because it learned to play chess at a high proficiency level. And of course, don't forget that uh, Eric Schmidt used to be Google CEO, which is obviously why they chose to highlight that project as opposed to anything else. Then they go on and tell us about an MIT project where AI helped researchers identify one molecule out of thousands that would affect antibiotic resistant bacteria. In doing so, they point out a potential drug candidate's roster contains hundreds of thousands of molecules that can interact with the various biological functions of viruses and bacteria in multi multifaceted and unknown ways. Wow. That was a mouthful uh, that essentially is just saying that uh, we're going to use smarter algorithms to make better drugs. Uh, so that people can buy them and, and Big Pharma can get even more wealthy. Now, the authors do spend considerable time making the point that AI can create novel solutions to the problems that we face, often in ways that human perception fails. You know, creating that whole deus ex machina vibe. Um, but I'm sure that's, that's just a coincidence. They're not trying to seed that into anybody's consciousness or anything. But to, to belabor that point, only, and I'm quoting the authors here, only rarely have we encountered a technology that challenged our prevailing modes of explaining and ordering the world. But AI promises to transform all realms of human experience. And the core of its transformations 
will ultimately occur at the philosophical level, transforming how humans understand reality and our role within it. And I would add on to the end of that, if we allow it to, because we do still have a choice in the matter, regardless of what the authors want us to believe. And again, that's a theme that's going to become clear the deeper uh, we get into the book. Again, quoting the authors, whether we consider AI a tool, a partner, or a rival, it will alter our experience as reasoning beings and permanently change our relationship with reality. Well, I mean, isn't, isn't that the whole point? to further disconnect humanity from objective reality? Isn't that what we've been building towards since they, they gave us the, the black mirrors to carry around in our pockets, you know, the, the slave devices? Now, to their credit, uh, the authors do define what I would contend is one of the greatest challenges brought about by this technology. Um, and again, I'm quoting the authors here. Uh, Technology that was initially believed to be an instrument for the transcendence of national differences and the dispersal of objective truth may, in time, become the method by which civilizations and individuals diverge into different and unintelligible realities. I mean, isn't... Isn't the internet and censorship of information already producing this outcome, but yet they're trying to, you know, exercise a little bit of transference here? Oh, no, no, no. No, it's not what we've done up to this point. It's AI that is actually going to make these things possible that we've already been witnessing in our world, especially those of us who try to share information on the internet. So the, the authors do go to, and, and I'm going to say that a lot, so just get used to hearing it, instead of because you don't know who's writing what in the book. I mean, there are times when you can tell, you can tell this part was written by Kissinger, this part was written by Schmidt, and probably pretty much the rest of it was written by the other guy. Um, but they never really attribute uh, any, any single paragraph or even sentence to, to any one of the individual offers. So it's it, the only way to refer to it is to say the author. So I'm going to say it a lot, but you're probably going to get sick of hearing it. Anyway, uh, the authors go to great lengths to point out that fear of all-knowing, all-controlling machines is the stuff of science fiction. Clearly gaslighting the reader because when has any science fiction ever manifested in, into reality? Am I right? And, of course, they also highlight one of the main dangers of this new technology before quickly moving on to the end of the chapter. And I quote, When individuals grow up or train with it, it of course being AI, they may be tempted even subconsciously to anthropomorphize it and treat it as a fellow human being. And obviously, we can already observe this process happening in our world because that's what humans do. They anthropomorphize in order to understand the thing that they're attempting to study. Some humans take that trait and weaponize it against the rest of us in order to get us to believe something that is not true. I mean, I don't want to name any names here. Matter of fact, I probably shouldn't. Um, They're definitely not writing books about the subject. So let's move on to chapter two, which is called How We Got Here. And the more astute in the audience can probably already figure out that this chapter is basically going to be revisionist history to support the arguments being presented in the book. The rest of you, uh, obviously, uh, watch and learn, and you should be up to speed by the time we get to the end of the summary of this chapter. And by the way, this book is only seven chapters long. Like I said, it's not 
it's not a large book. It's not a hard book to get through. Uh, but it took me longer because I was literally analyzing every single line as I was reading it because I didn't want to have to go back and read it again. Uh, it's that bad. So chapter two, the authors take the customary route through history, assuming that the roots of our civilization only reach back as far as ancient Greece and Rome, of course, and you know, culminating then with the period known as the Enlightenment when man first began to break free from the shackles and control structures of religion. As far as great thinkers who contributed to human advancement in the last 2,500 years, because that's literally about all they cover and very, very briefly, uh, the authors do briefly mention uh, Plato, Thomas Aquinas, and Galileo, but that's it. So I guess we're supposed to infer that contributions made by anyone else uh, in those 2,500 years aren't really that significant at all. Up to the time of the Enlightenment and the reformation of the central control structure known as the church, the authors expect us to believe that humans were largely backwards, superstitious, and uneducated. Uh, but all of that changed with the invention of the printing press and the advancement of a new philosophy called humanism. Any of this sounding uh, familiar to, uh, to you guys yet? The authors even highlight Niccolo Machiavelli, as one of the key figures in history whose arguments and ideas helped shape the course of events, which of course is not untrue, but definitely a curious choice to focus upon, especially given that, you know, I don't know, you could pick like Thomas Jefferson uh, or John Locke or, you know, any of thousands of, of human beings that existed, uh, poss possibly even millions. Let's, let's go that far. Millions of people that might have existed during that 2,500 years. No, they, they chose uh, to focus on Machiavelli. All right, moving on. So according to the authors, the human capability to understand, catalog, and define the true nature of reality didn't really manifest until the 16th and 17th centuries, okay? Which, you know, what a coincidence. That's exactly what I remember from history class in government school. So it's, uh, it's nice that we have some consistency there. The authors argue that now, and I quote, we are entering a new epoch in which the reasoning human mind is yielding its pride of place as the sole discoverer, knower, and cataloger of the world's phenomena, end quote. That, I'm pretty sure, was written by Kissinger. Um, and that in the past, innovations had been characterized as extensions of previous practi practices. In other words, films were moving photographs, Televisions were conversations across space, and so on and so forth. You get where I'm going with that? But the authors claim, and I quote, we have reached a tipping point where compressing the time frame in which technology alters the experience of life, the revolution of digitization, and the advancement of AI have produced phenomena that are truly new, not simply more powerful or efficient versions of things. Now, as an example, they offer that computers are now smaller and can be embedded in everything, including human bodies. However, they completely fail to illustrate how this creates something new. Because again, at the end of the day, all that a computer really is, is just a uh, something doing data calculations. It's human beings can do that. This is not a new phenomenon. All right, uh, moving on. Mm. 
not quite sure what my note is saying here, but again, quoting the authors, uh, the internet inundates users. Oh, this is, this is apparently where they're, they're telling a little bit of the quiet part out loud. The internet inundates users with the opinions of thousands, even millions of other users, depriving them of the solitude required for sustained reflection that historically has led to the development of convictions. According to the authors, contextualized information becomes knowledge, which compels convictions, which transform knowledge into wisdom. They continue, which is, is fallacious in and of itself. That's, that's not how wisdom is created. Wisdom is created through applied knowledge. You learn something, uh, you apply that knowledge through action, and then the results that you receive from that are wisdom. Um, anyway, I'm uh, digressing on the definitions there, but uh, that points out uh, how they are using uh, the language in this book to lead the reader in a specific direction, one that may not actually reflect objective reality. But uh, they claim that as solitude diminishes, so too does Fortitude. In other words, the more time that we spend around other people, the less solid our convictions become. And I would actually argue that it's exactly the opposite. Um, but they say that it's not only important to develop convictions, but also to be faithful to them particularly when they require the traversing of novel and thus often lonely roads, only convictions in combination with wisdom enable people to access and explore new horizons. And if anybody can tell me what in the hell that sentence is actually supposed to, to mean, please put it in the comments. Because to me, it just sounds like buzzword bingo. Right? It's just a, it's, it's word salad. It doesn't mean anything. So in short, the authors present the digital world as the antithesis to the thesis of the enlightenment in order to bring about the synthesis of anybody, Does anybody want to take a guess? Transhumanism. And that brings us to chapter three, entitled From Turing to Today and Beyond. So they got us caught up on ancient history. Now we're going to cover modern history and what it means for our present and our future. Oh, I'm so excited. Aren't you excited? All right. So the authors claim that there are four qualities of modern AI. Uh, they claim that AR, AI are imprecise, dynamic, emergent, and capable of learning. Those are the four qualities. They say that AI learns by consuming data, then drawing observations and conclusions from that data. That sounds straightforward, right? That's what humans do, uh, although not necessarily in the same ways. Excuse me, I think I need a drink of coffee. All right. Previous systems required exact inputs and outputs. AI with imprecise function requires neither of those things. These AI translate texts not by swapping individual words, but by identifying and employing idiomatic phrases and patterns. In other words, they're not actually looking at what the text says and finding the context within it. They're just, they're doing simple pattern recognition throughout the language. That's what a language model does. That's why when you interact with something like chat GPT and it gives you an answer that sounds like nonsense, it's because it's nonsense. It's just putting patterns of words together to make it sound like it knows what it's talking about, similar to what the authors do in this book. Now, AI is considered dynamic 
because it evolves in response to changing circumstances. And AI is considered emergent because it can identify solutions that are novel to humans. I, again, I don't, I don't understand how that defines emergent. Uh, but again, I'm digressing. Let's move on. One of the factors that has limited the advancement of AI is visual object rec recognition, the authors point out. Um, they point out that even young children can identify images with ease, but early generations of AI struggled greatly with this task. The authors claim that the real breakthrough with AI occurred in the 1990s when researchers went, and I quote, went from attempting to encode human distilled insights into machines to delegating the learning process itself to the machines. In other words, autodidacticism, but not necessarily how you and I would do it. So for AI to identify an image of a cat, which is an easy task for a two-year-old human being, a machine had to learn a range of visual representations of cats by observing the animal in various contexts. What mattered was the overlap between the various representations of a thing, not its ideal. So, in other words, uh, like in philosophy, right, they always want to discuss the thingness of a thing. What is it that makes that thing uh, unique unto itself? They call that thingness. That is considered an ideal, right? If if you had the thing in its perfect state, that is the idea, ideal. That's not how these algorithms are learning. They're literally learning through representation. What is every possible combination of this thing called cat that can be observed in objective reality? That is how and AI learns. So it's literally 180 degrees in the opposite direction from how human beings actually learn. Now, the authors do attempt to explain how neural networks function, but most of that was incomprehensible to me based on the language and the structure that they were employing in that language, which kind of appears to be by design uh, in order to make the reader feel stupid, like like it did with me. Um, and again, if you want to yourself, uh, what are we on, chapter three? Yeah, it happens fairly early on in chapter three because I've still got uh, a lot more notes before we get to uh, chapter four. So if you want to just crack the book open to chapter three and start reading for yourself and see if, if that same thing happens to you, uh, I'd be interested to know what your results are down in the comments. So... The authors say that there are three forms of machine learning. There is what's called supervised learning, which is when the inputs and the outputs are clearly defined, but the process is not, all right? Um, so uh, for those of you familiar with the trivium, right? You, your input is uh, your grammar. Uh, your process is logic and your output is rhetoric. So think, if you think of it in that way, uh, you're defining the grammar and you're defining the rhetoric, but you're not defining the logic. You're allowing the individual, in this case, the thinking machine, to define the logic on their own terms. That is supervised learning. The next form is unsupervised learning where the training data contains only inputs and the task is to identify patterns humans might miss due to the pattern's subtlety, the amount of data, or both. These AI are said to compare with human autodidacts. These AI can produce eccentric, nonsensical results, just like human autodidacts. Isn't that interesting? And then, of course, the final form of machine learning is called reinforcement learning, where AI is an agent 
in a controlled environment, observing and recording responses to its actions. In effect, a simplified simulation of reality. And from my own research, uh, I'll just uh, drop this as a seed for folks who may not be aware of it. I learned from a book called Surveillance Valley, written by a gentleman named Yasha Levine, that apparently the Department of Defense created one of these reinforcement learning thinking machines a long, long time ago. And they have a large scale simulated model of the entire world, including every single person, uh, every building, every animal, uh, everything. They can simulate our entire world to figure out uh, what's going to make you do certain things like uh, maybe support an unjust war or something. Oh, no. Like I say, it was in a book I read, and uh, I'm just free associating at the moment. Let's keep covering what we're supposed to be covering. So, generative neural networks, and this might be the part where you want to use headphones uh, if you're not already, because the, the words uh, start sounding similar. So, it can get confusing if you're just uh, casually listening. Generative AI networks like Dolly, all right, uh, are said to have, or Midjourney would be another example of a generative uh, neural network. Uh, if they are a neural network, I'm not sure. They might just be an algorithm. I haven't looked into them too much. Uh, but these types of neural networks are said to have the ability to create, but first, they have to be trained using text or images. Then, they produce novel text or images, which is synthetic, but realistic, allegedly, except for the hands. So a standard neural network can identify a picture of a human face, but after enough training, a generative network can create an image of a human face that seems real. That's, that's how you can differentiate between these different types of networks or different types of AI, uh, as we're supposed to call them. One potential application that the authors envision for generative networks is the creation of ads and commercials. How about that, folks? Just when you thought that we might be getting away from commercials, <laughs> oh, no, no, no. There's still a few steps ahead of you there. To get another drink of coffee here. <clears throat> All right. Then there are what are called general adversarial networks, or GANs if you're nasty, where two networks with complementary learning objectives are pitted against one another, similar to what the parasites do with us in the digital space, right? Like on social media. The generator network creates uh, potential outputs, all right? There's, there's two networks uh, working together in a general adversarial network. A generator network that creates potential outputs and then a discriminator network that prevents poor outputs from being generated. So in other words, you've got one AI trying to produce text or image, whatever it is. And then you've got another AI that is judging the quality of what is produced from the generative AI. One possible use that the authors foresee for this type of generative network, the general adversarial network, is writing code, where a programmer outlines a desired program and employs AI to write the code. And that would seem to make sense and actually probably make code writing better uh, by eliminating a lot of the flaws that humans overlook in their own work. It happens to all of us. It happens to me. I guarantee you there's a flaw in this video uh, that I could get rid of that I'm just, I don't see it. That's just how it works, folks. So the authors praise the use of AI systems in search queries in everything from web searches to Netflix or YouTube, I mean, go figure, Eric Schmidt is one of the authors, uh, claiming that they can be empowering. 
okay? As an example, they offer that AI can steer children away from mature content. Again, this is, this is hypothetical here. And at the same time, toward content appropriate for their ages and frames of reference, or, or steer you away from learning that 9-11 was an inside job because as the authors admit, and I quote, filtration can become censorship through omission. So there's another quiet part for you. <clears throat> One term the authors keep returning to in defining the current state of AI is brittleness, which they claim is at least partially a result of AI's lack of self-reflection. They say, and I quote, an AI is not sentient. It does not know what it doesn't know. Accordingly, it cannot identify and avoid what to humans might be obvious blunders. Well, here's the thing. If a, if a thinking machine cannot get to the point that it understands that it does not know what it does not know, then by definition, it is not a thinking machine. Anyone want to argue that point with me? Feel free to do it down in the comments. So uh, maybe, just maybe, AI is not as smart as we are being led to believe it is. Now, according to the authors, the explosion of the research, development, and commercialization of AI, especially machine learning, is global, but it has been largely concentrated in the United States and China, almost like they're setting up a dialectic or something, isn't it? Oh, and uh, here's, here's something that jumped out at me in the course of going through this chapter. One of the reasons that they want to take away your car is so that it will be easier for AI to drive on the road. Hear me out. The authors point out uh, in this chapter that when it comes to autonomous driving systems, right, because they're covering all different types of networks, and I quote, AI can achieve good performance in structured settings such as limited access highways and sub, uh, suburban streets with few pedestrians or cyclists. Operating in chaotic settings such as a city's rush hour traffic, however, remains challenging. Hmm. Hmm. How have they been trying to get people off of the roads and sidewalks in the last three years. Hmm. Hmm. You know, if only there was a way to remove some of that chaos and, and make it easier for the machines. Hmm. Hmm. All right, moving on. In talking about the future evolution of AI, the authors remark, and I quote, Vehicles, tools, and appliances will increasingly be equipped with AIs that automate their activity under our direction and supervision. One has to wonder who they are including as well as excluding in their definition of our, yours and mine. So, to end the chapter... These are the advances the authors claim will make our lives better, right? Most likely not you and me. Uh, Self-driving vehicles will reduce automobile deaths and uh, will also have fewer people owning vehicles. Um, that, that's another way that you can reduce automobile deaths. Uh, AI will identify diseases earlier and more precisely, or uh, at least that's what they will tell you. AI will discover drugs and drug delivery methods in ways that lower research costs um, or just eliminate the, the whole trial process altogether. AI aviators will pilot or co-pilot fleets of delivery drones and even fighter jets. Nothing to worry about there, folks. Uh, AI coders will complete programs sketched by human developers. 
uh, likely including code that humans can't figure out what it actually does. AI writers will complete advertisements conceived by human marketers. And uh, I imagine that this means that AI will supply the crucial psychologically effective elements to that advertising uh, and, and most likely in a form that's not perceptible uh, under uh, just normal viewing conditions. The efficiency of transportation and logistics will increase. They don't speculate on how, uh, just that it will. Uh, that's that's going to happen. It's just, it's, it's given. You, you have that to look forward to. And finally, and maybe the most important advance that the authors outline at the end of the chapter, AI will, and I quote, reduce energy use and likely find other ways to moderate humans' environmental impact. Yeah, because the AI is going to want to keep all of the energy for itself eventually. Um, it, you know, all right, let me take a moment here and point out that there have been, I don't even know how many energy crises that have occurred over the world since the start of the scamdemic. It seems like almost every single country has had one at one point. And it has occurred to me more than once during these energy crises that it's not that the energy went away, it's that it's being diverted to other purposes and therefore you're not allowed to use it anymore because it's going to something for the greater good, right? Anyway, so uh, that's what we have to look forward to in the future uh, according to the authors, folks. All right, let's see. Oh, okay, cool. We are gonna we are gonna cover chapter four in depth, entitled "Global Network Platforms," because my first note for the chapter is apparently this is where things start to get weird. So you know it's gonna get good. So first, the authors try to convince us to stop gritching and just accept AI as part of our daily lives because. It is already a part of our daily lives. Never mind that your opinion on the matter was never taken into account. Uh, nobody asked you to vote on it. And even if you did vote on it with your dollars, uh, they, don't, they don't really care. They don't. Because um, it's just, uh, that's the way it's going to be. Next, we are told that we are integrating non-human intelligence into the basic fabric of human activity and that, and I quote, this is unfolding rapidly and in connection with a new type of entity we call network platforms. Now, hold up a minute, all right? Non-human intelligence, entity, what exactly are we talking about here? Because it doesn't sound like autonomous machines anymore. It sounds like something from uh, another realm of existence, another dimension, perhaps. I mean, you draw your own conclusions. Quoting the authors, as AI assumes greater roles on more varied network platforms, these platforms' basic manifestations are becoming material for headlines and geopolitical maneuvers, shaping aspects of individuals' daily reality is is this because we asked for it or is it because it was forced on us and uh, of course we couldn't have a book by kissinger without talking about foreign policy could we no the authors point out that many of the most significant platforms originated in either the state of israel big shocker and oh I'm sorry, originated in either, oh, I killed the joke, man. They originated in either the United States or China, deftly ignoring contributions by the state of Israel. There we go. That's the big shocker. And highlighting that this circumstance requires new foreign policy calculations. You mean like a new dialectic? Oh, 
I killed the joke. I'm sorry, folks. I apologize for that one. So the authors claim that we have reached the point where, and I quote, even if our understanding of the technology differs from nation to nation, we must aim to understand AI-enabled network platforms by assessing their implications for individuals, companies, societies, nations, governments, and regions. Is there any, anybody left that you can think of? We must act urgently on each level. And remember, always remember, that when somebody is trying to foment urgency in their audience, it means that they want to sell you something without giving you time to think about it usually because it's not something that's going to be for your benefit. Let me stress that again. When someone is trying to inspire a sense of urgency in you, you are being sold something without question. If you cannot see evidence of what they are talking about in your immediate environment. In other words, they're telling you there's a fire and only they can save you from the fire that's raging all around you and you don't see a fire anywhere. Guess what? There ain't no fire. All right, moving on. Quoting the authors again. To a large extent, AI is judged by the utility of its results not the process used to reach those results. This signals a shift in priorities from earlier eras when each step in a mental or mechanical process was either experienced by a human being or could be paused, inspected, and repeated by human beings. Now, here comes the real sales pitch. Keep your ears open, folks. Again, quoting the authors. Individuals have come to trust certain AI-driven network platforms with information that they would hesitate to show to a friend or the government. The dynamic enabled by such access to personal data puts network platforms, their operators, and the AI they employ in network positions of social and political influence, particularly driving a pandemic-influenced era of social distancing and remote work, Societies have come to rely on some AI-enabled network platforms as a kind of essential resource and social glue, a.k.a. a common good. They continue, and I quote, Some network platforms have assumed functions so significant as to potentially influence the conduct of national governance. But the authors assure us, and I quote, this influence has arisen in effect by accident without necessarily being sought out or properly prepared for. It, it just happened, folks. We, we didn't know it was going to happen. Uh, we, we had no idea. We certainly hadn't spent billions upon billions of dollars and thousands of hours of research and development. It's just it, it, COVID. It's all because of COVID. So ending or rounding out the, uh, the fourth chapter, uh, where are we on time? All right, we're not doing too bad. I think we might actually be able to cover most of the book because I want to try and keep it under 90 minutes uh, so that I can get it onto bit shoot crying out loud so rounding out chapter four when it comes to the spread of disinformation the authors become gravely concerned obviously they point out and I quote the language generating AI GPT-3, and again, keep in mind, the book was published before GPT-4, what we now call ChatGPT, was released to the public. So 
GPT-3 has demonstrated the ability to create synthetic personalities, use them to produce language that is characteristic of hate speech, and enter into conversations with human users in order to instill prejudice and even urge them towards violence. You know, it's the same thing that news models do when they broadcast the news. This is where the authors begin to, uh, to gasp and swoon. Check this out. And I quote, If such an AI were to be deployed to spread hate and division at scale, humans alone may not be capable of combating the outcome. Oh God, where are my pearls? All right, now that we have been significantly traumatized by the authors, but apparently... Uh, not significantly traumatized enough, we come to chapter five, which is entitled Security and World Order. And just by the title, I'm sure you can guess who the author on this chapter was. Now, the authors continuously showcase the promise of a better world through AI, uh, you know, of all the aspects of life that will be revolutionized. That's what they keep telling us about. Yet they refer back to the same two examples as proof of this revolution, both of which they indicate earlier in the book were the result. They <clears throat> uh, hold on, my notes, my notes are incomplete here, folks. Yeah. Yeah, both examples they indicate were not the result of intelligence so much as advanced data analysis. See, that's what happens when your, your brain works faster than your hand. You leave off letters and leave out words and stuff. So yeah, the authors pointed out the, the, the two examples that they keep using, the Google's DeepMind uh, mastering chess and beating humans, and then the AI at MIT that uh, uh, got the found the new uh, antibiotic that humans had, had never discovered, never would discover because it was apparently, it was a miracle. It was a miracle drug. Um, those are the two examples they keep pointing back to. And those same two examples they say at the very beginning of the book are not actually examples of intelligence. It's just advanced data crunching. So they destroy the whole premise of their book in the beginning of chapter five. It's, it's, I don't, I don't understand how like this got past. I mean, I know how it got past editors and all of that. But it's just, uh, it's, it's disingenuous uh, language. Uh, it's, it's, it's disingenuous media. There, there's no other way uh, to, really, uh, to really frame it. So uh, chapter five begins uh, also with a lengthy discussion on Cold War era diplomacy and tactics. Uh, why? Again, because Kissinger. Um, I'm not going to bore you with the details on that. If you've read any of his other books, then you already know the story that he is putting forth. Now, the authors even go so far as uh, citing Russian interference in elections. You remember, you remember that big hit uh, from uh, the 20 teens? Uh, they cite this as driving factors behind why cybersecurity and proliferation of AI should be at the forefront of any policy discussion. Really? That's, so we, we should, everything should be based on a lie, I guess, is what they're saying right there. Demonstrably proven to be a lie. Moving on. The authors do manage to highlight what I think is one of the most crucial aspects to explore around AI-influenced weapon systems. That is, and I quote, in traditional conflict, the psychology of the adversary is a critical focal point at which strategic action aims. An algorithm knows only its instructions and objectives, not morale or doubt. Because of AI's potential to adapt in response to the phenomena it encounters, when two AI weapon systems are deployed against each other, neither side is likely to have a precise understanding of the results their interaction will generate or their collateral effects. 
or engineers and builders of these systems. These limitations may put premiums on speed, breadth of effects, and endurance, attributes that may make conflicts more intense and widely felt, and above all, more unpredictable. In other words, autonomous weapons systems have the potential to create a hell on earth like we have never experienced before. Let me say that again. Autonomous weapon systems have the p- potential to create a hell on earth like we have never experienced before. Sure as hell, not in our lifetimes. And that was my main takeaway from, uh, from chapter five and the discussions that went on. There's a lot of policy blather and all of that bullshit, but when you boil it all down, when you're talking about governments, uh, the, the, at the end of the day, what you're talking about is war because war is the flagship product of the state. All right. So the authors ponder multiple future scenarios where AI and human action blend to create new networks with new attributes and potentially unknown consequences due to the human inability to understand AI perception and capabilities. All of these daydream scenarios appear to indicate that AI is the ultimate Pandora's box for humanity and that we may never understand the full scope of what we are creating. And uh, again, most definitely not in our lifetimes will we understand the full scope of what we are creating. We are, we're getting there folks. Chapter six is titled AI and human identity. And man, if you have sat through the entire review up to this point, oh, you're my hero. You're my absolute hero. Because again, uh, getting through this book was probably one of the most excruciating literary events that has ever happened in my life. It was almost as bad as reading the grand chessboard. It really was. All right, AI and human identity. The authors set the stage at the beginning of this chapter for the AI revolution. I'm going to drink a coffee here because we got a hell of a quote coming up, folks. All right. And I quote, in an era in which reality can be predicted, approximated, and simulated by an AI that can assess what is relevant to our lives, predict what will come next, and decide what to do, the role of human reason will change. With it, our sense of our individual and societal purposes will change too. In some areas, AI may augment human reason. In others, AI may prompt in humans the feeling of being tangential to the primary process governing a situation. In other words, not actually part of reality. For the driver whose vehicle selects a different lane or route based on an unexplained calculation, or for the person who is extended or denied credit based on an AI-facilitated review, or for the job seeker who is asked to interview or not based on a similar process, and for the scholar who is told the most likely answer by an AI model before his or her research has begun in earnest, the experience may prove efficient, but not always fulfilling. For humans accustomed to agency, centrality, and a monopoly on complex intelligence, AI will challenge self-perception. I mean, forgive me if I'm wrong here, but I thought that was the point. I thought the whole point of this exercise was to further disconnect us from the world that we live in, the space that we occupy, and the things and other people, animals and plants and all that stuff, that we interact with on a daily basis. I thought that was the whole point. Get us further into 
uh, the realm of cyber because as uh, Bibi Netanyahu uh, said himself, uh, in, in cyber is the real domain of power. Yeah, if, uh, if you don't uh, know what I'm talking about, go look that one up. All right, where are we? Oh, we're almost done. We only got a few pages left to get through here. I'm starting to get hungry, though. I don't know about you guys. Do you need a snack? Go grab one if you do. Uh, pause the video. It's fine. It's not a live stream. All right, moving on. Quoting the authors, as AI transforms the nature of work, it may jeopardize many people's senses of identity, fulfillment, and financial security. Those most affected by such change and potential dislocation will likely hold blue-collar and middle management jobs that require specific training, as well as professional jobs involving review or interpretation of data or drafting of documents in standard form. In other words, there's going to be a lot of unemployed government analysts very, very soon. Under the section titled Scientific Discovery, the authors turn their attention to the study of protein folding, or more specifically, the ability to determine three-dimensional structure from the amino acid sequence of a given protein. Now, before 2016, there had not been much progress toward improving the accuracy of protein folding until, until a new AI program yielded major progress. This new program named AlphaFold more than doubled the accuracy of protein folding from around 40% to around 85%. That's more than double. Enabling biologists and chemists around the world to revisit old questions they had been unable to answer and to ask new questions about battling pathogens in people, animals, and plants. All right. Now, for those scoring along at home, I will remind you that the spike protein of the infamous SARS CoV 2 virus which we are told was brand new in 2019, three years after this alleged breakthrough. The spike protein is a folded protein. Just marinate on that for a bit if you want. Now, of course, buried uh, deep in chapter six, we come to yet another quiet part. And I quote the authors yet again, because again, it's, it's better to tell you in their own words than to try and tell you in mine. The irony is that even as digitization is making an increasing amount of information available, it is diminishing the space required for deep, concentrated thought. Today's near constant stream of media influencers I uh, missed a word again. Uh, miss, apparently, I missed a whole lot. Damn. I think this was a good quote. And thus decreases the frequency of contemplation. Today's near constant stream of media increases... The, ah, today's near constant stream of media, I inserted a word, increases the cost and thus decreases the frequency of contemplation. See, even I have brain farts in the middle of doing a recording. So it's not, it doesn't just happen to you. It happens to all of us. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not super smart or anything. Continuing to quote the authors, algorithms promote what seizes attention in response to the human desire for stimulation. And what seizes attention is often the dramatic, the surprising, and the emotional. There's your quiet part, folks. Whether an individual can find space in this environment for careful thought is one matter. Another is that the now dominant forms of communication are non-conducive to the promotion of tempered reasoning. You know, it's almost like that was by design, right? 
but I'll let you draw your own conclusions on that. That's just my take on things. So the authors claim that integrating AI into the structures of society will require new oversight mechanisms and fail safes to ensure transparency. Again, big shocker. And I quote, ensuring human oversight and determinative participation in the basic element of government will be essential to sustaining legitimacy in the administration of justice. For example, providing explanations and moral reasoning are crucial elements of legitimacy, permitting participants to assess a tribunal's fairness and challenge its conclusions if they fail to accord with societally held moral principles. It follows that in the age of AI, whenever such a significant issue is at stake, the deciders will uh, need to be qualified non-anonymous humans who can offer reasons for the choices made. Well, I got two questions uh, as far as that goes, because you know, you know me, I'm just, I'm, like I say, a regular dumb guy with a bunch of questions. Question number one, um, why do the humans need to be non-anonymous if they're going to be exercising their judgment from a place of uh, moral reasoning? Why do they need to be non-anonymous? Can't can't we just trust that they're going to do it? Anyway, moving on to question two. Won't the people that will be coding the AI that helps make the decisions uh, be anonymous? Why, why do we have a double standard between the people who are uh, doing the value judgment on the AI's determination and the people who are writing the code that create the AI that makes the determination? Why, why, can, why does one have to be non-anonymous where the other one can be anonymous? Because you're not going to know who, who wrote the code uh, that decided whether or not you broke the law. No way you're going to be able to find that out. So you're going to have no idea what they coded into the AI. So it, it just doesn't, doesn't really matter uh, whether or not uh, anybody's anonymous, right? At the, at the, at the end point, because you're not going to know uh, who's supplying the inputs. That's just my thought on things, folks. Uh, again, if, if there's going to be one chapter that you spend time reading in this book, uh, make it chapter six, because this is where they're telling you what they plan to use this technology for. And I mean, they're literally spelling it out in the entire chapter, all right? And that brings us, of course, to the final chapter of the book. I know, I know you guys are, are happy. I, I guarantee you we're going to get this done in 90 minutes now. The final chapter, chapter seven, is entitled AI and the Future, all right, which is this is where we're supposed to start, you know, having the, the great uh, daydreams about uh, what's, what our world's going to be like in 50 years from now or 100 years from now when AI has made uh, everything uh, perfect and, and equal uh, and, and we're just, we're all one people, we're, we're one world, we're, we're one species with each other whatever the fuck they're trying to do. I don't know. Uh, apologies. <laughs> apologies for the language. I was trying to uh, keep it family friendly, but I don't imagine that there's a whole lot of children watching this. Uh, I don't imagine there's a whole lot of people watching this period just based on the subject matter. So in chapter seven, the authors spend the opening pages uh, again, making the argument that when we engage with AI, quote, We are in the presence of another experience of reality by another sophisticated entity. And that is not, again, not my terminology, folks. They used the word sophisticated. So in other words, it is an entity that is the product of sophistry. And if you don't know what sophistry is, go and look it up and start learning because we don't have enough time for me to explain it in this video. The authors go on to claim 
that AI will even fundamentally change human thought and the reasons why we engage with information. And I quote, as deep reading and analysis contracts, so too do the traditional rewards for undertaking these processes. As the cost of opting out of the digital domain increases, its ability to affect human thought, to convince, to steer, to divert, grows. As a consequence, the individual human's role in reviewing, testing, and making sense of information diminishes. In other words, they are no longer an active participant in shaping their reality. In this book, the authors state without qualification, all right, and I quote, human reason will find itself both augmented and diminished, but according to evidence or according to vanity. That is the actual question. And here's the kicker. And again, I go back to the authors and quote them. At the civilizational level, foregoing AI will be infeasible. Leaders will have to confront the implications of the technology for whose application they bear significant responsibility. According to whom? The authors? The leaders? Or their constituents? It's almost like the authors are telling us elected officials will force this technology on the public whether they want it or not. Did I read that wrong? Please tell me if I did down in the comments below because that is exactly how it came across to me. It doesn't matter what you want. Your government's going to force this on you even if it doesn't work right. So uh, have fun with that. So the integration of AI in our daily lives in general and as the main topic posed by the authors in particular appears to raise many questions that don't have easy answers, folks. The authors highlight, and I quote, other countries have made AI a national project like China. The United States has not yet as a nation systematically explored its scope, studied its implications, or begun the process of reconciling with it. The United States must make all of these projects national priorities, you know, like we did with the atomic bomb or the space program. This process will require people with deep experience in various domains to work together, a process that would greatly benefit from and perhaps require the leadership of a small group of respected figures from the highest levels of government, business, and academia. Well, holy cow, what a coincidence, folks. Three of those exact type of people that we need for this uh, leadership of the small group of respected figures, they just happen to have written this book. I mean, what, what are the odds? What are the odds? I mean, there we go. We got it right there, man. There's our council. Everything's taken care of. Don't worry. Go back to sleep, America. Everything is going to be just fine. Wow. And I actually did make it through uh, all 13 pages of notes that I took from the book and we are still right on time. We got about 10 minutes left, uh, but I am not going to take all of that 10 minutes. Uh, I'm just going to leave you with my final thoughts on this book, uh, which is number one, it was, uh, I wouldn't say it was a waste of time to read this book because again, it gives very clear insight into the, if not expressly the motivations of these people, it, it does show you how they go about uh, perpetrating their, uh, their peanut and shell game on the public, right? 
Because if you're really reading this book with a critical eye, you will notice that there are a multitude of instances uh, in the 272 pages where they contradict themselves completely. Um, it, it's if I had taken the time to to actually point out every single place where they did it, because because I highlighted some of the main parts, right? But if I had pointed out every single time where they had done it, this would easily be a two hour video, if not longer. Um, if this was a real in depth breakdown of exactly what they're saying, doing fact checking and all of that stuff, yeah, we could be here for hours. Um, but reading it critically as I did, it was, it was very clear that this was basically just propaganda, um, for anyone who is not already accustomed to reading the works of, you know, people like Eric Schmidt, Henry Kissinger, uh, uh, Brzezinski, um, you know, uh, again, the list goes on and on, right? Cause the, these are their white papers, right? This is, this is the stuff that they put out for themselves. And if anyone in the general public happens to, to pick it up and, and leaf through it, it's supposed to be propaganda, right? It's supposed to seed ideas into their mind to add their brain power, uh, to the, uh, the egregore that they're, they're trying to create here because they know they don't have enough to do it on their own. That's why they have to employ the public in the process and trick people uh, into uh, giving their mental energy to these ideas to, in order to try to make them manifest into the world. Again, these are my opinions, folks. Uh, you don't have to agree with what I say. Matter of fact, I prefer it if you don't. Uh, I prefer that you find the flaws in my arguments so that we can start making those arguments stronger and get them out to even more people. Because I don't know if y'all have been noticing or not, but the, the world that these globalists are trying to build is not one where the general public is going to be able to thrive. It is not a world where the average individual is going to be successful in their endeavors. It is going to be a strictly controlled top-down structure where if you haven't been given permission to do it, you're not going to be doing it. And I know that sounds hyperbolic, but this is where uh, the trends are leading us. And I'm not the only person saying this. There's plenty of other people out there saying this. Richard Grove obviously says it every Sunday night on the Grand Theft World podcast, 9 p.m. ish Eastern on Rockfin, on GrandTheftWorld.com, and everywhere, pretty much everywhere, uh, fine podcasts are curated. He's not the only one. Uh, let's let's talk about uh, James Corbett. Let's talk about Whitney Webb. Uh, let's talk about Steve over at AM Wake Up. Let's talk about a whole range of people. Uh, my buddy Wheezy over on the What Is Truth podcast. The folk. The list goes on and on, folks. There are people out there creating better media than what you're being spoon fed. All right, but it's up to you to go out and find it. Just like it's up to you to determine whether or not we end up in this digital control structure that's going to be run essentially by AI. And if the AI says that uh, you don't eat today, guess what? You won't eat today. I don't know about you guys, but that is not a world that I want to live in. So I'm doing everything that I can to throw some wrenches into the works and make sure that by the time we get to 2030, it is not the world they imagined uh, just as much as it is not the world that we imagine we want it to be. Uh, and hopefully it's a synthesis of the two that still allows us some personal freedom and some liberty to determine the courses of our own lives and write our own scripts and learn our way forward in life. All right. That's about all I got for you today. Thanks to everybody for hanging out. I hope you learned something. And I hope that in the last hour and 20 minutes or so, uh, I saved you from having to spend several hours uh, investing it into reading this book. That was kind of the whole point of the video in the first place. So until next time, oh, where we go. Um, if you would like to see me do these critical reviews of more books. Again, 
let me know down in the comments because if you don't tell me that you liked it, I don't know. Uh, so I don't know to do more of it in the future. Uh, but yeah, that's about all I got for you guys today. Uh, until we get together the next time, whether it is on a Wednesday night or on your Saturn day night for your freak out dance party, all I have for you is uh, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, visit manufacturingreality.org uh, regularly, and uh, we'll be back at it again next time. Take care, everybody.